Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him, to reveal to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Bruce. Well, good day, everyone. Uh, great to see you, and uh, hi to those watching online. Uh, it's great to be back in Matthew's Gospel, isn't it? We uh, started in Matthew a while ago, and now we're back into it this term. Uh, but before we get into this passage, uh, perhaps you've heard this parable. Maybe you've heard it before. Um, uh, uh, a group of blind men, you go to the, the picture up there, there's a group of blind men uh, heard that a strange animal called, called an elephant had been brought to town. Uh, no, one knew, no one had ever heard of or knew what an elephant was before in this parable. Uh, uh, they go up, these, these blind men, and they start inspecting the creature. Uh, the first man touches the trunk and says, this animal is like a thick snake. Uh, the second man comes up and touches the ear and says, no, 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 no this, a this, this animal is like a big fan. The third blind man goes up and touches the leg and says, no, 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 no you've got it all wrong. The creature is like a, is like a pillar, like a tree trunk. Uh, the fourth goes up and touches the side of the elephant and says, No, 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 guys, you've got this all wrong again. This creature is like a wall, a solid wall. The fifth is at the back, a uh, dangerous place to be, and touches the tail of the elephants and says, No, no, guys, you've got it all wrong. Uh, the, this elephant is actually like a snake. It's a, a, a slithery snake. Uh, oh, there's a sixth guy who touches the tusk and says, Okay, everyone else is wrong. This creature is actually hard and smooth and sharp, like a spear. So this argument breaks out between these guys, each one insisting that their version of the elephant is correct. And then there's someone looking on from the balcony, we can see, and he calls out to them and says, No, 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 each of you is only touching one part of this creature, this elephant. You need to put all the parts together to find out what the elephant's really like. Anyone heard this parable before? Uh, maybe you've heard it. Uh, it, gets, it often gets applied to um, uh, when people talk about religions. It often gets applied to religion. The moral goes something like this. No one religion has the truth. We're all part of the bigger picture. We all see something of the, big, something of the bigger reality. We just need to hold it all together to grasp the truth about spiritual reality. Uh, maybe if you haven't heard the parable, you've heard that kind of argument being made before. Uh, I'm sure most of us have. Um, and you can see the power of this kind of parable, right? This kind of argument, it urges us to humility, uh, that we recognise that none of us has total access to all, like, we're just limited human beings. But the story has some serious problems too, this parable. Uh, it, while it urges humility from others, there's actually an immense arrogance at the heart of this parable. Um, the author, Tim Keller, puts it like this. How could you know that each blind man only sees part of the elephants unless you claim to be able to see the whole elephants? How could you possibly know that no religion can see the whole truth 
unless you yourself have the superior, comprehensive knowledge of spiritual reality you just claimed that none of the religions have. You see what the, the, criti the criticism of this is? Is actually to, to claim this parable uh, as teaching all religions have a part of the, the whole truth is in a way a deeply arrogant claim because it says that you see the whole truth where no one else does. Uh, but there's another problem with this parable. It doesn't take seriously the actual claims of the actual religions of the world. And in particular, what we're thinking about today, it doesn't take seriously the stunning claims of Jesus. The stunning claims of Jesus. Jesus doesn't claim to be one more blind man sort of touching part of the elephant and telling everyone what he's feeling. That's not Jesus' claim. The question Jesus confronts us with, if I, could, if I could put it this way without being disrespectful, the question Jesus confronts us with is this. What if the elephant spoke? What if the elephant, what, what if this reality that humanity is blindly searching for revealed itself to the world? And told the world who it was and what it was like. If that happens, if that happened, if God revealed himself, then to believe what he says, to have confidence in that, that wouldn't be arrogant at all. Not to believe it. To reject God's own revealing of himself. That would be the position of arrogance and pride and folly. So friends, the Christian claim is not that we need to grope blindly around to find our way to God. The wonderful news of the Christian gospel is that God has come down to us. In our blindness, in our lostness, He has come to open our eyes and to lead us home. The amazing claim of the Christian gospel is that he has done that once and for all in the person of Jesus Christ. And that changes everything. It changes everything for every person, in every place, in every time. So friends, this is the stunning good news that's on view here in Matthew 11. Incredible good news. Before we get to, uh, dive into more details of this passage, what I want to do is to just take a step back. As I, we started in Matthew's Gospel last week, I wasn't here, uh, but I just wanted to set a bit of context so we're all on the same page. Um, we're, we're in an ongoing kind of repeating series through Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew records the good news of Jesus. And there's this, um, this cycle in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew breaks his Gospel into these chunks of, you can see there, chunks of action, Followed by chunks of speech, like you get big blocks of doing stuff, there's talking in there as well, but then there's big blocks of Jesus speaking, Jesus teaching. There's five of these blocks of teaching that split the gospel up, uh, and uh, we've kind of split up our own series according to them. We've seen a couple already. Uh, we've seen in the first couple of chapters, uh, Jesus um, is the long promised king who was born, uh, the one promised in the prophets. Uh, then Jesus announces the good news of the kingdom from chapter 3 onwards. Uh, he starts to gather disciples around himself and then teach them the surprising way of the kingdom in his Sermon on the Mount. So that's that next chunk that we looked at last year. Uh, we've seen Jesus show his amazing authority, his miracles in chapters 8 and 9. That was last year as well. And then we heard his authority as he, he sends out his disciples on mission in chapter 10, that block of teaching and speaking. Okay, so that's what's going on in Matthew. This term, we're going to look at the just three chapters in Matthew, chapters 11 to 13. And I've given it the title, The Hiddenness of the Kingdom. The Hiddenness of the Kingdom. Same kind of cycle, a chunk of action followed by a chunk of teaching. Uh, and, and what you see in these chapters is you start to see this rising opposition to Jesus. And misunderstanding of Jesus, and even a kind of disappointment in Jesus. Uh, there's something about Jesus that people didn't expect. Uh, we, we started to see that last week. If you were here last week, when uh, Chris Jolliffe 
um, spoke from that passage at the start of chapter 11. We, you saw that even John the Baptist, even John the Baptist, <laughs> was confused about Jesus and had his own doubts about whether he really was the one who was promised. Uh, but that was a, a misunderstanding. John took his doubts to Jesus, and that made all the difference. But what you see in this passage is this kind of pattern gets intensified. It gets intensified. Uh, it's a pretty intense opening to what Jesus says here in verse 20. Uh, but it's a hint that Jesus is talking about something really serious, something really important. Verse 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Uh, so Jesus has spent most of his time in this one fairly small region in um, a, a region called Galilee, one small part of that. He spent most of his time in there around the Sea of Galilee. And he's performed amazing miracles. And if you've been with us through Matthew's Gospel, you'll know that. Uh, healing people, driving out evil spirits, taming storms, even raising the dead. What was Jesus looking for as he performed those miracles? What was he looking for? There were many people who saw Jesus, saw the great things that he did. Many people who were really impressed by Jesus. Uh, we're told earlier in Mark that large crowds followed him. Large crowds followed him. They were curious about what he could do. Uh, maybe even that he could heal them or help them. But there was one thing, the main thing Jesus was looking for that they didn't do on the whole. Jesus denounces these towns because on the whole, when they saw his miracles, the people didn't repent. See, Jesus' mighty works of power, they weren't party tricks to kind of impress people around him. They weren't even just good things Jesus did because he could do them. They were signs. They were signs. They were signs that pointed to the amazing reality of who he is. They were signs screaming out to the world that the king of God's kingdom has come. That the Lord has come to redeem his people. And if you read the signs properly, the only right response is to repent. Uh, repent, repentance means, all that means is turn around. This means to turn around. Admit you've been going the wrong way. Admit that you've been proud towards God. No, recognize that. If your life has been going the wrong way and turn from that way and turn to Jesus to trust and follow Him as your Saviour and your King. That's what repentance means. When God comes to earth in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, if that really happened, <laughs> if that really did happen, the only right response, the only sane response is a whole of life response. A turning of everything. A handing over of everything to Him. So that nothing is the same anymore. Everything changes. But these people who saw Him in the flesh, who saw the most amazing miracles right before their eyeballs, you know, they were right there. They... I, I, I guess, I mean, we're told in that place, they were, they were kind of amazed, they would have been excited, impressed. But what Jesus tells us here is that after the thrill had died down, they basically went back to their everyday lives unchanged. And Jesus has this strong warning for them. Uh, he names three of the towns in this region that he's been living in. You can see a map there. Um, uh, up around the Sea of Galilee, that's a map of um, Israel, and uh, it's in the north of Israel there. These three towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Uh, they're all towns around the Sea of Galilee, north of Israel. And he says in verse 21, he says, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. 
It's this solemn warning to, of Jesus to the people of these towns. Uh, in a way, it kind of complements is the opposite to, remember what we looked at ages ago, that started last year, um, when Jesus gives a sermon on the mount, and the opening of that, what does he say? Blessed, <laughs> blessed are you, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he pronounced blessing in that sermon on the mount. Here, he pronounces woe, woe to the proud in heart that will not repent, even when faced with the clear evidence of Jesus' own miracles, with that sign sort of proclaiming to the world who he is. Uh, so what Jesus does then is to, to drive this point home even more forcefully. He uses examples of, um, of towns. Uh, so he's, he's already named three towns. He uses examples of other, uh, three other towns that get, get named in the Old Testament. And that they're, they're, um, they're kind of known in the Old Testament and condemned in the Old Testament for their, kind of their uh, outright wickedness, these towns. Uh, verse 21, Jesus says, If the miracles that were performed in you, Chorazin, Beth, uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida, if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, uh, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Later on in verse 23, he says this when he talks to Capernaum, the other town that he was in. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. So this, as I said, these cities, Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom, they're all mentioned in the Old Testament. You can find Tyre and Sidon in the Prophets. Uh, Sodom uh, is in, in Genesis, a famous story, you might know the story of Abraham and Lot, uh, rescued out of Sodom. Sodom becomes kind of this byword for human um, uh, wickedness and hatred, and it's destroyed by fire. And Jesus' point here is to have seen him, to have seen him and all the miracles that he was doing, to have had the Son of God in your midst, and not to repent, not to turn and to follow Him. That's something far worse than anything that was done in, in Sodom or in Tyre and Sidon. Get, get what he's saying? Get doing here? He's saying that the worst, kind of the worst examples of human wickedness in the Old Testament, and he's saying, this is much worse. This is much worse to have, to have had the King of God's kingdom in your midst and not to have turned, not to have repented. And he keeps raising the stakes here. He makes the stunning claim in verse 22, but I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Or down in verse 24. I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Friends, Jesus believed in a coming day of judgment. Uh, and remember from our series from last year, if you remember from, if you remember that far back when we looked at the end of everything, that coming day of judgment is, in the big story of the Bible, is fundamentally at its heart a wonderful and good thing. Uh, it's the day that all creation longs for when every wrong will be put right, when this groaning world will be set free from the, broken of it, from the brokenness of sin, when God's perfect and good justice will be fully revealed, when dark evil forces are finally and eternally defeated. But alongside that, and tragically, those who don't repent, Jesus' sobering warning here, is for them that day will not be a good day, it will be a, a terrible day. They will be swept up in that fierce judgment. Friends, if you haven't repented, you might be impressed with Jesus. <laughs> uh, you, you might be interested in him, someone to learn some things from. You might have been coming to, happily coming to church your whole life. But if you continue just being interested and mildly impressed, taking a little bit from here and there, 
Jesus says, woe to you. Woe to you. It's a solemn and a strong warning given out of his grace and his love given because he wants you to turn. Jesus wants to wake you up to the danger you're in so that you can respond rightly to him so that you can repent. If you have repented, that kind of big R repentance, now repentance goes on the whole of the Christian life. It's the, the posture of every Christian is a continual repentance. But there's a, a kind of capital R repentance where we first of all turn back to Christ. And if you have done that, you are one of Christ's person, people, people. Will you receive Jesus' word here as true, really true, as true not only for you but for your neighbours, for your friends and family, true for every person in Encounter Bay and Victor Harbour and Port Elliot and Middleton and Goolwa, true for every person in South Africa where our CMS partners the Rose are, uh, or Tanzania with the Davises, or Chile with Francis Cook. Brothers and sisters, this conviction about the judgment of God is gospel fuel for our mission to this world because we have such good news to share. Don't be too proud to receive Jesus' own teaching, to let it sink down deep into you. And to shape your own heart. It really matters. It really matters how we respond to Jesus. It matters eternally. It matters for every person in every place. And Jesus goes on to fill us in with why it matters. Fill us in more with why it matters so much. It matters how you respond to Jesus. Because it's in Him and Him alone that God fully reveals Himself to the world. Uh, verse 25. At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. A, a speaker and author called Glenn Scrivener tells this story about an Iranian woman he, he once met. Uh, this Iranian woman, um, her cousin, got, managed to get hold of the, a copy of the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus' life. And they snuck away together to read through these Gospels. Uh, as they did that, they, they met this person of Jesus and they had their, like their minds were blown. <laughs> they were blown away. The more this woman read, uh, the more she got to know Jesus, the more she thought, oh, here is a God I can believe in. Uh, she was thrilled at the idea that God might be like Jesus. Uh, eventually she came to this conclusion. Uh, she told Glenn Scrivener, the, uh, the guy who tells the story, she told him this. She came to the conclusion that God cannot be the God of the Ayatollahs. He must be the Jesus God. The Jesus God. So she's seen something of what Jesus is talking about here. See, being a Christian isn't just believing in God in some abstract sense, in sort of divine force or divinity. Um, Another author, I'll tell you another story, another author that I know called Tom Wright, he tells of conversations he would have with students when he was a university chaplain. And people would come and talk to him, and they'd come and tell him, oh no, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. And Wright's respond, Wright, uh, Wright, Wright would, res would respond, excuse me, and he'd say, oh that's interesting, uh, which God don't you believe in? And they'd got, kind of give a puzzled look. Uh, and then they describe some picture of deity, usually a remote kind of detached force. And Wright would then respond, Look, I'm not, I'm not surprised that you don't believe in that God. I don't believe in that God either. I believe in the God I see revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. Friends, there is no other God but the Jesus God. 
That's the claim Jesus himself is making here. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. It's like this closed circle, right? Father, Son, united together in the bond of the Spirit, the eternal Trinity, this closed circle that we can't break into. But here is the wonder of the Gospel. Jesus opens the circle for us. Jesus makes us, it possible for us to be welcomed into the heart of God. Because what does it say, verse 27? No one knows the Father except the Son and wonder of wonders <laughs> and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. And who is this son? What kind of a person is he? Is he reluctant to reveal the Father? Is he miserly, kind of holding back? Is he harsh? Well, next week we're going to reflect on what Jesus goes on to say about his very heart for sinners and sufferers, his very heart of mercy and humility. But we read the first part of that, we won't get that, we'll save that for next week, <laughs> but we read the first part of that in chapter, in verse 28 today. See, the same one who said, woe to you, is also the one who says, come to me. And they go together. The same one who said, woe to you, is also the one who says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. If you come to Jesus, you don't need to be anxious about whether or not He will receive you. He delights to reveal the Father to those who repent, who come to Him in faith. And what would that kind of genuine repentance that Jesus was always looking for when He was doing His miracles, that He calls for here, what would that look like? We've had hints along the way in this passage. Uh, if you remember back in verse 23, the people of Capernaum, there's this pretty really interesting phrase, they thought they were going to be lifted up to the heavens. I think there's a hint there that, that the problem in, in these people was a kind of spiritual pride, a confidence in themselves and their own goodness. Uh, and, and we've kind of skipped over this, but if you get down to verse 25, Jesus fills this out more. God has hidden these things from the wise and learned, from those who think they can figure out God on their own, <laughs> by their own wisdom and learning. We will never find God if that's our approach, no matter how smart we are, no matter how good we manage to be. Who does find God? Who does God in Christ choose to reveal himself to? To little children. <laughs> to little children. I, I think there's probably a, a literal element to that and a figurative element. <laughs> like God, God reveals himself to actual little children who from the earliest years can have a saving trust in him. But there's a figurative sort of sense to it too, right? It's those who come to him, whatever their age, like little children. But what are children like? <laughs> children are great receivers. Children receive. They, they trust. They hold out empty hands to receive. That's the way. The only way to the Father. Not in your own wisdom and strength, but recognising you can never reach God on your own. And then through humbly receiving, trusting in, the way that God the Father has in fact revealed himself in history, in the person of his son, Jesus. And friends, if you do that, it's a sure sign that at the same time, Jesus has been working in you and chosen you to reveal the Father to you. But where do we get to in all this, friends? Uh, God is. God is the Jesus God. There's no other God. 
than the one revealed in this historic person of Jesus uh, that has been uh, witnessed to in the prophets and the apostles that we have in the Spirit-inspired Word in the Bible. Which means that everything hangs on your relationship to Jesus. The same Jesus who calls and invites you to come out from under his woe and enter into his welcome, into his eternal family. So come to him today in repentance, turning from your sin. Come to him, not with your hands full of yourself and your own righteousness, but just with the empty hands of faith. Childlike faith. And you will not only find safety from judgment, you will find the Father's embrace. And as we're going to reflect on next week, you will find true and lasting and wonderful rest. That's the promise that Jesus holds out for us. Let's pray. No one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. We are unable to break into this, our God. In our sin we have fallen from relationship to you. But in your wonderful grace, you have made a way for us to be reunited to you. And we thank you for that. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you, our God the wonder of the gospel and we pray that you will give us humble and repentant hearts or perhaps even for the first time today pray that we might repent turn around recognize we're going the wrong way and turn to you open handed open hearted to follow you as our lord and king make that posture of every day of our lives we pray Father, may we hear this invitation of your Son. May we take it seriously and joyfully come to him and receive life. We pray that for your glory in Jesus' name.